let's break the mold. Start believing and stop waiting for the other shoe to drop. Welcome to Wild on 7, presented by Pilot Games. We're here until it's here. And welcome back to Wild on 7th, your favorite wild podcast presented by Pilot Games. Boy, how momentum can shift in a playoff series. The Wild come back after taking a big L in Dallas. And it's amazing for whatever happened between the flight in Dallas and the the drop of the puck in St. Paul, the Wild really found their game, man. It was that last game was maybe the perfect playoff game. Maybe the best game I think I've seen a Minnesota NHL Minnesota team play in the postseason. They gave Dallas absolutely nothing. From the start of it, it was um, a great show with the lasers on the ice to Mason Shaw, let's play hockey, to Erickson Eck in the starting lineup, and then it was just everything else was in the rearview mirror. They almost no scoring chances to talk about from Dallas. Their stars were quiet. They got beat up. They got pushed out. They got, uh, in some ways, probably embarrassed a little bit out there. And in the end... The Wild regain the series lead two to one. Kinger, you had a you had a pretty good vantage point for this one. Um, how was our how was our favorite Wild fan taking this game in? It was great. Snuck into a suite uh, late. I think there was a late cancellation or something, and I was a seat filler like the Academy Awards. Um, yeah, the shaman comes out with the crutches and does the Alberta shaman. Hockey. I mean. It was like Tiny Tim. I was waiting for him to fall in the snowbank. It was the greatest. And, you know, <laughs> we work for the Wild, right? And they kept that under wraps. Did you know that was happening? No idea. Yeah, and so when he comes out, I'm like, I, I, I'm like, that's Mason Shaw. <laughs> like, they wouldn't know. <laughs> like, he snuck out there and did it or something. But I thought that was a great way to start it. And then, you know, this podcast is dedicated to helping uh, turn Minnesota into Winnesota, breaking the mold, mold right? And what a stress-free night. Let's just roll on down to the X, 8.50 start, pregame at Herbie's, got a table for you in the back, split a burger with the wife. We're going to score first. It's never going to be in doubt. Even when Dallas does score, you're still going to be singing shout, and you're going to miss it. It doesn't. You <laughs> won't even know. I, everybody in the rink was like, what? Wait, they scored? What? Because it was, all they saw was the face-off. They thought it was the next one, and uh, – I don't know that I've ever had a more stress-free. It was like watching a rom-com for 90 minutes. It was just enjoyable, pop a little popcorn, and uh, yeah, we're back on track. And there were some great signs last night um, from the Wild, and I liked our game. We looked like us. Yeah, it looked back. It looked like they found themselves again, where they turned the puck over. I was looking through the analytics too, and we'll get into some more of the hockey stuff later. Yeah, get us some nerd stuff. Well, we gotta we gotta celebrate all the good stuff first. We'll get into the hockey stuff, but zero rush chances against for Dallas. They, while didn't turn the puck over, it was le- legitimately per- potentially like a perfect hockey game. Um, but a let's go a let, Picasso. Yeah, let's go chronological order. Where does you know? I was kind of rattled too. So when Shaw does let's play hockey. I didn't have it in my headset, so I couldn't hear him. I saw him, and I was waiting for the, all right, everybody say it with me, let's play hockey. And I couldn't hear the first part. Like, what was he saying? Uh, he, I, I don't remember it verbatim, but he did a nice job. It was heartfelt. Um, there was a little more preamble than normal. Yeah. So he was saying, like, guys, let's stick it to Texas hockey. Or I mean, he said something like he had a few sentences. We don't get pushed around. Yeah, he was great. Please welcome Minnesota Wild forward Mason Shaw. Take it away, Mason. How we doing, Minnesota? Friday night playoff hockey. The Exile Energy Center. Home of the Wild. Home of the state of hockey. And home of the best damn fans in the league. We're running down a dream and we're bringing you along with us. So I need you to get up, get loud, so they hear us in Texas. So say it with me. Let's play hockey! That might be the best one we've had. <laughs> Move over, PJ Fleck. And, um, and then, can we welcome Matt Zuccarello to the chat? as he shows up early to just get into playoff mode, which was so nice. Um, when we get him going, 
Uh, I mean, pretty interesting. You got uh, three points from Hartman, two points uh, from Matz, and no points from 97. I mean, that's at some point we got this 97 and 12 kind of back here on the, the back grill, and they're going to start popping off. So if you think of the series, pretty nice that it's coming from different guys in different games. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to wrap up on Shaw, I loved the image too because it looks like him in the jersey with the collar on and the tie underneath looks like every college picture ever taken for like the the program. So at first it took me a minute to recognize who is this guy. Like I thought he was like a college dude. And then it's like, oh, the it's crutches is the best. Yeah, leaning on him it's too. It's just the best. And and Hartman said that they had no idea and it was supposed to be a surprise and they had a good shot of the bench and guys were I think they were jacked up after seeing Shazi out there. Would you would you just continue to do that every game? I mean, is that the Gloria for the Blues? I mean, wh why wouldn't Mason Shaw do it every single time? Uh, it's just a question. Maybe it ruins it. Maybe they eventually lose a game. But to me, if we got this Mack truck plowing through the playoffs, I'll take Mason Shaw as my hood ornament any day. Well, I think everybody knows hockey players are superstitious. So if it worked in, <laughs> if it worked in game it three, night. you got to roll it out the same way game four. Uh, who's, doing, who's doing less play hockey? Yeah. And then, so the Erickson Eck, too. Now, this was, this was a huge owl. This one, like, it felt like, okay, oh, my goodness, Hartman's in the lineup. Erickson Eck is back. Home ice, XL Energy Center. They've got the rally towels. Like, this, this series could potentially end tonight is what it felt like. And it was loud when they announced him in the lineup. Yeah, it was unbelievable. And then he takes a 19-second shift. He just... Loses a draw, spins back to his own D zone, little hop, skip, something happened, felt something, tweaked it. Blocks a shot. Yeah, Warrior ends Hammer. up blocking a shot. And then right down the tunnel after. But it was amazing how that didn't affect the club whatsoever. And they they didn't skip a beat. The line still kind of stayed intact. They they all played together. You know, Johansson still was unbelievable. But to the point that you're making, too, and, and I think what you're saying is – a lot was made of Robertson and Kaprizov and the stars of the series and how, you know, we'll see which one of them ends up being better because that's who's maybe potentially going to win the series. It's been everybody else. It hasn't been Kaprizov, Boldy. It's, you know, Zuccarello. And I think he got challenged, and I honestly do think that it was he was on his last leg, so to speak, with Kaprizov where, hey, I don't want to have to – and Everson's been really good. He's talked all year about challenging guys, coaching harder, and I think he's very honest with them. And the way that Zuccarello played, it almost looked to me like he knew that maybe this was his last chance to play a long 97 unless he picks it up somehow. He was like, peanut butter and jelly's good. But have you ever had just a peanut butter sandwich? <laughs> Maybe with some honey. Yeah, I better get the bread. I better get it going. <laughs> they take this jelly away, man. This could be tough to choke down. Well, uh, he sure did respond. And uh, uh, one thing that bothers me a little bit is that Hartman's thirty-eight and Zuccarello's thirty-six. I mean, as an analyst, it's just half the time I don't know exactly who's doing it, but they're doing good things. And I mean, he was so that relief for him, right? Because he's a vet. He's been carrying that. He knows he hasn't been playing his best, and to have a game like that was just outstanding. Yeah, and it was like the way he played the game that was impressive and stood out to me too. He, on one power play, he digs the puck off the wall on one side and falls to his knees, extends it, and that's where Klingberg ends up hitting the post um, because of the work that Zuccarello did on the wall. And then the play continues for 15 seconds, and he hustles his butt over to the other side, turns a puck over there, and extends the zone time again. Like, he's all over the ice. Like, he was working, and it was on the walls. It was through, through neutral ice. Like, he got the breakaway chance, ends up scoring on it. And I touched it on the broadcast, too. How often do we see Zuccarello two-on-one -on -one with his buddy, 97, give 97 a little look off, pick his spot on net, and nail it. Like you hey, could tell. He that, was playing for something last Daddy's night. gonna take care of this one. <laughs> I uh and he was physical last night. That's what I mean. He yeah. was mixing it up with guys. So there was one draw where he was lined up with Suter, and I thought he was asking Suter to fight. <laughs> and it was it was and 
that stuff doesn't go unnoticed on the bench either. So, like, if you have Zuccarello, and I, I, I don't have the stats in front. I don't know how tall he is, but he gives up quite a few inches and a few pounds to Ryan Suter. And if he's sitting there cross-checking back and forth with Suter, asking Suter to go and Suter denies that one, I think that's, like, the, the turning point. Like, oh, my goodness, like, let's roll. Yeah, quite the homecoming for Mr. Suter. Uh, the crowd was uh, lustily booing him last night and a variety of different things. The only thing we didn't get, I actually thought we were going to get the goalie, you know, the the flurry. I thought they were going to do that to Suter too because they had, uh, you know, Suter sucks chance going. I mean, it was, uh, you don't, that you get, a, he gets booed every time he touches the puck, which is pretty common. Dumba's getting that in Dallas, but man, they were vocal. Um, it was wild. I mean, he, it's pretty clear uh, people don't like uh, 20 beating up on the, the beautiful Russian baby. So did you, by chance, get a, an opportunity to listen to the post-game pressers? No, I'd love to hear what they said, though. Well, Dean Evison clearly listens to the pod. No. He's a fan. What did he say? Well, so the he said he he mentioned the fact that the crowd was fantastic, tons of energy. He alluded to the fact that it was an 850 start, and then he said to to the effect that it was and we'll have Hus throw this one up there. It was wild on 7th Street last night or crazy on 7th Street. Tonight it was a level that was like off the charts. And Somebody said 7th Avenue was pumping before they got into the rink, um, which probably helped. No way. Yes. I've got the chills right now. I know. He listens to the pod. He understood that what went on on 7th Street is a precursor to what it will be if the Wild continue to play like this. It will be wild on 7th Street. Can, that's great. Can I give you a, just a little anecdotal fan stuff? Uh, I go to Herbie's pregame, right, because I'm classy. And uh, it's super crowded in there. We haven't eaten. No chance. As I said to the lady, I go, there's no chance I can get a table. Because you so know they said, have. I'm John King, co-host of the Wild on 7th podcast. Can you get me a table? That doesn't work. <laughs> um, but, but you know, uh, uh, you know, it's just packed in there. But you know that back room they have in there by where you enter? By the fireplace, yeah. Yeah, and you can sit in there. There's ta- like old oh, yeah. tables Outside in there. Outside of the outside. actual bar area. You're not really in here. Yeah, you're in the lobby yeah. of the building. Yeah, where you're sitting by the guy with the the handlebar mustache and I go I'm sure you don't have anything and she goes not a chance it's crazy tonight and then she just stops and looks at me and she goes you know what wait a second I'm gonna wipe a table off and she took us back there I split a burger with with my wife it was great and I I made up a game last night before we get Burnside in here and start going back to serious hockey you know we're we're only a couple years into the pod we're not making our own vodka yet and beers and all this but we made up a game called Hot Lap, okay? So you always take a lap when you're at the rink. And it's one of the great joys of hockey is between periods you do a lap. But when you're on the suite level or club level, you don't really do that. But there's one suite that I happened to be in last night or a couple that are down on the main So level. you went to a couple suites last night? No, I went to one suite. A little humble brag there. But it's down on. You there's kidding some, me? There's some suites on the first level. Are, now, are we talking S-W-E-E-T or S-U-I-T-E? S-U-I-T-E. Oh, boy. Um, so, so we made up a game, you get a pair of you or a single and you say, we're going to do a hot lap. You give them three things they have to see before you get back and they give you three things. So it would be like guy in an orange wild hat, but he's got to be wearing it backwards. Bougard Jersey, somebody in anything, Edina, you know, I want to see a a cowboy hat. I want to see, I want to see a USA Jersey, any college Jersey being worn by a girl. And you just go through, it's like bingo. Hot lap, you're zipping through the crowd. It. This is going to, I want this to be a thing. Hot lap. Hot lap. You pick three things, you go with your buddy, and you could say anything. You could say, uh, my son did a um, guy with a handlebar mustache, which I thought was a little dirty. And even Edina was a little dirty because we know they're up in the club level in the suite, so it's hard to find an Edina person down on level one. But uh, but we play hot lap, and it was. it's a great game. Dude, we're going to have to do this on Wild on 7 Socials where there's hot lap. You create a checklist yeah, before the- each game, <laughs> tweet it out, and then fans will just post the pictures of what they're seeing on the concourse in their hot lap. And we had, uh, um, like, I couldn't find a Gabbert jersey for some reason. There was, like, 50 of them. But, but sometimes you just don't see it. You just fail. Um, but one thing I'll say, as I was doing the hot lap, 
probably had 10 people say they love Wild on 7, so we're getting a little traction out there with the pod, and I want to thank everybody that's listening. Uh, you're helping break the mold. I was giving knuckles to people. It's like uh, people are ready to not be losers. I went running outside today in the snow. It's April 22nd. Let's have something good happen, Carson. <laughs> and last night's, Let's have last something night's good win happen. motivated you. It was great. Ordinarily, ordinarily would have been a stressful game. I would have ate pizza. I maybe would have burned it, left it in there. You know, <laughs> it would have been trying to comfort myself with calories. Wake but up instead, with, today I woke up. I went for a run in the snow and make up. Wake up with Morgan Wallen playing on my AirPods. The so. Uh, I want to know grit first. Was there any grit in the stands last night? Because you've got Minnesota nice. <laughs> was there any grit? We can't show that picture. Though, <laughs> I think we it. have to show no, it. Not because it, I, it's too bad. So there was a guy sitting in front of me, <laughs> and he had made his own T-shirt, which, by the way, is a whole different category. It was a by the by made his own T-shirt. It's a white T-shirt that he colored on with markers. So it's like fruit of the loom colored on face paint, uh, and. Um, and so at one, these guys were standing the whole game. And at one point, my son kind of said, "Hey, you mind sitting down? I know you've, I know you, you know, you know." The guy turns around, and he goes, "It's playoff hockey. I'm standing the whole game." So this guy's done a drawing here of uh, the Wild logo, and it's bleeding, or no, it's lava, it's fire, and he has Ryan Suter kind of falling into a quagmire of flame. He's written game three on it because they must make a shirt for every game. And he has an arrow and it says Ryan Suter. So you know that that's the guy that's falling that's into the sinking fire pit. into the lava. Or... He, he's written Suter sucks on the bottom. And then he has a variety of players. Uh, ben. The Dallas is stars. Ben. Uh, Basically. Sagan. <laughs> Sagan. But I'm. I'm not going to say what's happening to them because it's a little much. But um, he has actually just a hand with blood on it holding a stick on one of the sides. But the part that was impressive, Grit First is a really nice playoff line. It's 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 real for this team. His playoff line on the back of the shirt carts, all caps, none shall live. <laughs> and he's written 2023, but if you notice, he accidentally wrote 2013, but he had to change the <laughs> one, two, two, two. three. <laughs> none shall live. Do you think the I, when we were doing the playoff campaign, uh, we didn't we didn't look at none shall live as one of the options. But <laughs> as it turns out, it could have been put great. it in the bank. It could have yeah. been. We'll bring yeah, it so, out next year. So, you know what's good about that though? The Wild are playing Old Testament hockey. Dallas is playing New Testament. This Jamie Ben turn the other cheek. You know whatever that is. If you want to win in the Stanley Cup playoffs, it's Old Testament. It's eye for an eye. It's yeah. it's hard. It's, if your cheek's not bleeding, you don't deserve to win. It's it's rock and fire, and I mean it's you know, it's it's Old Testament, and that's Moose. Moose is Old Testament. Jamie Ben is New Testament, and and that's the way this is playing out. And if they want to play that way, you know, go for it. I thought Moose did a good job of flipping the script where the. You know, it's the cat and mouse game psychologically off the ice where DeBoer is all over Everson, dropping these subtle hints about uh, penalties and, you know, trying to get more power plays. And Dean counters with the the fact that he believes that Dallas is diving. And Moose is – now, this is the second time in, in a couple of games where Moose is starting to maybe play the role of teacher's pet a little bit, where – Remember the Winnipeg game where he was like, don't talk to our coach, don't do this. And then Dean says that, you know, the Dallas is diving and Moose goes out there and he made it pretty evident through his body language that he felt and was, was telling Dallas that they're diving. Uh, but the the message was sent and, and I think he flipped the script on him. He threw it right in their lap, right in Pete DeVore's lap and said, there you go. Um there's your penalties. The Wild dominated that one. I thought Marcus was great in that regard. Um, the last part I want to talk before we bring Burnside in to talk hockey is tarps off. To talk and, professional hockey. Yeah, t- tarps, tarps off. Did, uh, it, is there a chance that that can go too far? Like 850 start, I think pe- people were gassed up, and there were some – there were some bodies. I did see a guy with a shirt off, there actually. Was a guy off last night. Yeah. <laughs> well, people were juiced. Uh, <laughs> one thing that was interesting is Herbie stayed open late. Good for them. Uh, I happened to be there. Believe it or not, I was the responsible one last night. But um, you know when you're in the, the car ride home in the Uber and someone rolls down a window? 
and the Uber driver's like, hey, hey. <laughs> That's when you know it's a playoff game that started at 850. But uh no, it was it was electric in there. People I mean, that's a late start for Minnesotans. That we're bound to get in a little trouble if we got that much time on our hands down on old wild on seventh. Um so yeah, people were ready to go. Um I, and really the only place after, I know the St. Paul Hotel closed early. Uh, I go to that backside, Rice Park, but I, I wonder what it was like down 7th. I bet it was buzzing at Tom Reed's till late. For sure. I want to I wanna bust your chops for one thing. I have a bone to pick with you. Oh, no. What are you doing splitting a burger? You can't have so, you can't have a waitress be like, "Hey, you know what? I'm gonna clear this table off for you. I'm I'm gonna make your night here." And then you go split a twelve dollar burger and you tip her seventy five cents. You have to like get your own burger. And tell me, please tell me, at some point, you ordered double slaw. <laughs> I should have got double slaw. Hey, we already got pre recorded ads here, cards. <laughs> Just throw to it after you uh, defend yourself. I am wearing a Jimmy's jumpsuit, but um. Uh, I like to split. I, I feel better. Um, you might have enough fourth meal later. Um, light on your feet. I love a split. As a matter of fact, I split 90% of the time with my wife. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's our relationship. It's, I'm a little older than you. I'm pretty soon. So gonna, what's, when does that happen? Uh, how old are you? I'm almost 40. Uh, f- Five years from now, and I'm about five years away from buying those little Diet Cokes that aren't the 12 ounce one that like my parents have because you know the eight ounces, yeah, because you don't want to wait, you like, or, or putting the 12 ounce or back in the fridge because you haven't finished it. I'm getting <laughs> you're gonna close start to buying that. two liters, I'm getting close to that. Yeah, it's a, it's a slippery slope, but uh, I like to split. By the way, the burger at Herbie's is outstanding. I had the Herbie's burger and it was really good, cooked perfectly. Are they a sponsor, Huss? <laughs> Speaking of sponsors, let's do it. It's playoff time, and that means it's playoff beard time. And nobody has your beard sorted better than the folks at Duke Cannon. Whether you want beard balm, beard oil, beard wash, they have it all. Check out DukeCannon.com. Use promo code BEARD10 for 10% off. Don't leave this stuff to people who don't know what they're doing. Trust the experts at Duke Cannon. Get that playoff beard rocking. Well, everybody, it's back. The Aquarius Home Services and Connecticut Customer Appreciation Open House event is happening Friday, May 5th through Sunday, May 7th. Connecticut Water Treatment Systems will be up to 30% off. Salt and water filters are 20% off. New heating and cooling systems up to 25% off. Food and fun for all. And be sure you bring in your water sample for a free water analysis. It's the Aquarius Connecticut Open House event. May 5th through the 7th in Little Canada at 694 and 35E. Details at AquariusHomeServices.com. All right, we're back. Uh, as always, Duke Cannon sponsors our interviews. This is more than an interview, though. I would say uh, Scott Burnside's really the, the third wheel or the third leg on the stool as we're pushing through playoffs here. The editorialist um, working for the Wild now. Welcome back to Wild on 7th, Scotty. Uh, what did you make of um, that luxurious ride on the Gus bus last night. <laughs> uh, I, I, I will answer that, but I, I, I love none shall live. Yeah, none shall live. Just, none, none shall live. <laughs> <laughs> They're calling for blood. You know it's bad when I honestly can't post that picture on the Wild on 7th Twitter because I think the league would get involved. So I, I somewhere in my closet at home, uh, I uh, the Philadelphia Flyers used to have uh, every game during the playoffs, they would have a T-shirt on every seat, and it would have some sort of saying. And I have one at home that says "Vengeance Now." It, <laughs> they were playing Pittsburgh, but that's all there is. There's no other reference point. Vengeance Now, but none shall survive or none shall live. I would, I, I would wear a shirt that said that. Playoff campaigns are hard because the playoffs are medieval, and so when you end up writing lines. They're unbuyable because they're so aggressive. Like we were trying to sell member Malice for the Chalice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but you, you couldn't. Uh, the Lightning's campaign this year is Strike Back, mm-hmm. which is pretty, uh, you know, it's kind of doing the right balance of the, the lightning, lightning thing strike, and the aggressiveness yeah. thing. But um, I will say uh, when this team does play grit first, it does seem to work. Yeah. So you, uh, now when you ask about the Gus bus, and I actually uh, I had a note on it in my, my file last night, and – um, because there now are two two important Gusses on this team. Yeah, there right? certainly are. There's 
the old young Gus Gustafson who like it, you talk about a perfect game and like I I was trying to remember you know was there a time that Gustafson was under duress or that you're like oh my god like how how is you know this is the real push from Dallas like I, there really wasn't one yeah and I think what they well, I have the stats right in front of me look at me 24 shots for the Dallas Stars um, which is a very manageable amount, and um, so uh, it, that's that's perfect, right? You you're not playing double overtime. You're not taxing a young goaltender in his first playoff run, and you know it's gonna you know, he's gonna play in game four, yeah. right? So so this is I think part of the Minnesotan in me too. I, I left the game last night feeling bad for Mark Andre Fleury because it was. Man, this team has played unbelievable in front of Gustafson. Two straight games. Like, no odd man rushes against in either game. And then Fleury was kind of just straight up thrown out to the wolves. He first shot against his Rupe hints on a breakaway, and then it was all downhill from there. Yep. And it is, and I'm not taking anything away from Gustafson, the way he played down the stretch. He was great in game one or his performance in Game 3. But he really didn't have to do that much, and that's a credit to everybody else in front of him. He had to stop the 23 shots, and a couple of them were dangerous, but I can't remember him having to make a big save uh, where he was, to your point, under duress, where he had to make two saves consecutively. Didn't happen. And there was nothing where he had to move side to side, whether it was on the penalty kill, five on five, nothing through the seam, very little through traffic. I think he, I, I, I saw two or three pucks deflected that he had to stop, but it, they weren't dangerous. They were the suitor floaters from top of the zone, out in the corner, you know, easy to track. Um, e I mean, for me to say easy to track, I'm sure it's harder than it is. But, um, again, it's like, I, I just left that one being like, man, I, I feel for Marc-Andre Fleury because had he been in this game, it would be a different narrative too. Like he sure. he would have pitched a, a you know one goal against dominant game too. But nonetheless, I think you're absolutely right. Going into game four, that storyline subplot, who's going to be the wild goaltender, probably speaks for itself. And um, it would be a statement, though, if Everson and the group comes back with Marc-Andre Fleury, but I don't know how they can. Um one thing on you don't need to feel sorry for Flurry because he's the nicest guy in the world. I, I caught him. That's on why the, you feel bad for him. I caught him on the jumbotron though, um, just like hugging Gus after the game. I mean, what a he's had a history in his career of just being great, a great partner to other goaltenders. And um, I mean, it was what it was. Uh, you, you know that lineup in game two, tough. You know, rugged. the only difference in the lineup was. Erickson Eck for Steele, and Erickson Eck didn't play. Nope. Well, Hartman came back in, too. Hartman, Hartman was good. John Klingberg. Yeah, Klingberg. And Boldy playing center. Yeah. Yeah, it was weird, you know. Yeah. Point is, it wasn't that big a difference, but I mean, the way they played was a lot different. Um, but uh, the, the fact that he is that nice, that good of a pro, that good of a teammate is what makes me feel bad for him. Yeah. You know, you'd like to parade him out there, and who knows how much longer we're going to be watching one of the greats play. You'd like to see him, you know, have a game like that. But yeah. nonetheless, yeah, Gus. Terrific. Maybe split a burger with Flurry <laughs> at some point. Yeah, maybe five more years. He's splitting with Gus. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Though, like I talked to both those guys uh, for a piece um, early in the series, and you know, I've I've known Mark Andre for a long time. Spent a lot of time in Pittsburgh over the years. You know, because of. Crosby and during my time at ESPN and, and the athletic and so you spend a lot of time around someone and like it's so crazy right 17 straight years that he's in the playoffs um, no goalie's ever done that he's one of seven players I believe who ha have this kind of playoff streak um, and he just like do you, do you do you remember before game one and Flurry was out and he put up this mock Gustafson like scarecrow thing in the yeah, net right. with the balloon head and like that's you know how could you and and Gustafson said you know I feel like this is a hobby right with my best friends so how else how, what better way to help prepare a young goaltender for you know the the time of year when people get broken right the, the playoffs can break people and it you know 
maybe it doesn't happen in part because of what Fleury means to Gustafson and has allowed him to become as not just a player. <laughs> Gustafson talking about, you know, I want to be, I don't want to be the goalie when I go away from the rank. I want to be a normal guy. And I think Fleury is a really important part of that. And who knows where this road goes. And, you know, maybe we do see Fleury again, but he's, he's pretty self-aware. He's like, you know, I know I'm, I'm just about at the end and all, all I want to do is win. So, so the playoffs are in, Medieval, in your words, John. But does it seem medieval when Gustafson's in that? Or, like, he, it seems like he's in, like, this little bubble right around his own cage where it's not medieval. No. It's just, he, it's it's happy. There's sunshine. It's just smiling. Seems like a very nice place to be. Like, that's where I'd want to be hanging out. Well, if you think of the Gus bus, right? I think a lot of times you yeah. think of an old it's a, bus. It's a VW those, bus right this, now. This has got a plush interior. <laughs> It has side airbags. Yeah. It is. There's some. Uh, there's a, some snacks. Yeah. There's drink holders. I there's think a there's vacuum. a surfboard on the top. There's a vacuum yeah. in the floor. <laughs> it's on a I Honda. Mean, it is. It's a. Uh, I split. Uh, but there. I mean, he 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 is he is a calming influence. Whether it was the team in front of him or it's kind of chicken egg, right? I don't know. But I want to go back to Nyquist. Yeah. You and the only reason you're saying that is because he called it before the series, but that's okay. But he's been awesome. I had no idea. I remember when we traded for him. I remember thinking that guy was a he was a good player at one point. You know, it's sort of like I remember my son collecting his hockey cards six years ago or whatever. I didn't have any context on him. Man, he's a really nice player, and he's been great in the playoffs. All three of those deadline guys yeah. have been valuable pieces. And uh, I love watching him play. Yeah, I, I and I, I'm truly not dropping names or whatever. But I was talking to Bill Guerin this morning about Nyquist for a piece that I'll write in the next day or two. And um, it's funny. I talked to Jody Shelley, uh, who's the color analyst in Columbus, uh, just for some context. You know, what do you when you think of him? What do you think of? And he's like, you know, people are like they want him to come back. They're like, they, this is like a loner, right? <laughs> because he's a UFA. And coming to the end of his deal, and Columbus is terrible. But the, Jody's point was, th- th- you don't, you couldn't ask for a better guy in your room to be a leader, to be a pro. And you know, Dean Evison is—he's been asked about Gus Nyquist every single day, because every single day something happens where you're like, "Hey, can you talk about Gus Nyquist again?" Because, well, he's the only wild player in history of the franchise now with points in his first three playoff games and and he and it's both sides of the puck right like and and you'll have a better feel for this but I see him strip pucks from guys and I see him on the right side of the puck and then you know jumping in and making plays to you know to to lead to offensive chances and he's just He's just real smart. Yeah, and the Gaudreau, it was a two-on-one where Freddie Gaudreau came down with Nyquist, and he tried to beat Ottinger on the glove side. It was a D-zone play from Nyquist that broke that play up. So he he created the turnover with a good stick, and then off to the races, he and Gaudreau two-on-one. And it's little subtle plays like that. He's been good on the wall, getting pucks out of his own zone, off the breakout. But the, And I think this is actually a credit to him. It hasn't been flashy. Like he hasn't done anything super sexy where you're like, "Oh my gosh, this guy's he's unbelievable." But he hasn't made mistakes either and he's just like steady plays, like right time, right place, battle, but he holds on to pucks at the right time. Slows the game down. He gets rid of them at the right time. And I just want to talk about him off the ice for a second. I haven't communicated with him really at all. But I observe through time around him, what he's like. This dude looks like he could step in and be the president of Sweden while also playing in the NHL. Like, there's no slouch in his body language. Like, everything is buttoned up. I don't think I've ever seen him with his suit jacket unbuttoned. So he's like pocket square debonair guy? But perfect. Hair is always perfect. His posture is absolutely perfect. Like, if he's sitting... And he's a plus-two handicap. And if he's sitting on the bus, like, it's there's no slouch. Like, his feet aren't up. You know what I mean? It's like... It's like all business, professional, and then that's what it is on the ice too. It's a professional game, understanding of how it has to be played, what he has to do, goes out, executes, throws the suit back on, does the hair nicely, and then boom, on to the next one. It's pretty, it's, it's, it's awesome. But don't, don't you think this is, you know, we talk about being a product of culture and what you learn. Like what did you learn in New Jersey and being around, you know, Eliash or 
whatever, you know, you learn in the culture of a winning team. And you think about where Gus Nyquist learned his trade. And he learned from Nicholas Lidstrom and yeah. Nicholas Cronwall and Thomas Holmstrom. And I'm only naming these Swedes from the Detroit Red Wings, you know, when he first broke into the, to yeah, the he NHL. The you know, he... So he learned at, at that time, it was before the change in Detroit, but he learned in the culture from some of the greatest Swedish players of all time and certainly some of the greatest players of all time bar nationality in Detroit. And I think that's why he was so beloved in Columbus because he brought that to that Columbus team and he was part of teams that, you know, for a team that hasn't had a lot of playoff success, he was part of whatever they had, you know, and upending Tampa, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, again, Bill Guerin said, you know, it was – pretty acceptable risk, the deal, right? Because right. Even though you didn't know he was coming back, you felt that the timeline was going to work. And the interesting part, which um, I didn't really realize, is that instead of rehabbing where, somewhere here or in Columbus or wherever, you know, and whatever he was going to do, he came here right away after the trade and he traveled with the team. And he said, I felt that was, I could watch and I felt I understood the team and how they played from watching them up close and being on the road and going out to dinners. And, and when it came time to play, it, he didn't look like a guy who'd missed months of action and was playing you know, with people he had never played with before. He, it's a seamless thing. And it's easy to say, but pretty hard to do. But he's, you know, it's a pretty remarkable you know, uh, translation for him under you know, pretty severe circumstances. I mean, he's been, I bet he's he, been great. I bet he uses a shoehorn. For sure. And when he's not wearing his shoes, he puts those stretchy things in them? Actually, I think it's possible he doesn't use a shoehorn because... <laughs> Why? He, well, so I use a shoehorn because I never untie my shoe. Okay. I don't want to have to go through all that effort. Yeah. I don't think he's skipping steps. <laughs> no. So I think he'll like be you know, Sits diligent. Down yes. on a stool. Yes. <laughs> Unlaces it, slides the foot in, tightens it up, perfect knot, even on both sides. Like He just strikes me as that kind of dude. But uh, the... But the is, Detroit it a shoe, teams. is it a shoehorn though with the long handle? That's so how I roll. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, how so I roll. I wish I had one of that. <laughs> Put the cigarette at the end yeah. of it. But hold on, I, I want to make one point. It's that all the Swedes in Detroit that you were you were touching on, Franz and all these yeah. guys, the Swedes, they were good. They won cups, and um, that's let's, really let's the point. Do that. I'm just saying, Swedes, the Swedes win. Yep. Yeah. All Swede, no finish. Or wait, wait a minute. So hey. Uh, where were the goals being scored last night? Because I want to, I you know, when you're in the um, rink, it, it's a different experience. It's super fun, but you don't really get to watch it as well. Where were they beating Ottinger? Did we learn anything about scoring on this guy? I know the first couple games watching him on TV, it's you got to go high. It's the only way you can score on him. Is that what happened last night, or what was happening? Early on in the game, what it looks like to me with him is that Ottinger wants to win the game. So he, I, I think he's even maybe trying a little bit too hard. So like if you look at go watch the Zuccarello goal and there's an angle where the puck goes and it does it deflects hard and it goes over to Hartman then back the other way Ottinger pushes so hard back to his right that he makes the rebound goal for Zuccarello pretty easy and I think it's him wanting to just make huge saves like Minnesota factor maybe yeah like he he wants to be the game's number one star and he's one of us yeah so the game like he's not letting it come to him he's forcing a few things so they were able to capitalize on some over aggressiveness from Ottinger for sure uh but it was in for me again Zuccarello he scores a rebound goal he's net front like you, we never see that and his numbers were facing Ottinger like if you see Zuccarello score a rebound goal, it's going to be passing through on the forehand. You know, it's going to be crest facing the goal. It was the opposite, right? And um, that was the difference in the game for me last night with these goals is the fact that um, there was pressure in the crease. There was pressure on Ottinger. And um, Zuccarello scored. He picked it. the rebound goal. Uh, he picked his spot on the other one. Um, but I, I don't think that there was anything that stood out in terms of like their finding tendencies in Ottinger. It was just execution of hockey. Just and, a great game. Yeah, just just good hockey. But the only hole I saw in Ottinger was the fact that maybe he I, – I, I get the sense he's trying a little too hard, and he's trying to manufacture the magic he had in the playoffs last year, not letting it come to him. Yeah, to me there were a couple of things. And, and well, the Zuccarello goal, um, the – the second one, right? The mm -hmm. snipe. Yep. But the, 
the Johansson goal, who that move around Colin Miller, like that's pretty incredible. But then that shot again, quick, high, you know, those are those are good. Those that's hot. That, which goalie is going to stop that, right? Like I, that's not on Ottinger. I think that's a skill play that beats a good goalie, and it yeah. may be any good goalie ninety percent of the time. But for me, the one that I, I thought the power play, even though they just scored the one goal was um uh, there was so much traffic in front of Ottinger and right yeah. like that's the ultimate like how many who what NHL coach during the playoffs says we're not going to use any traffic at all <laughs> we want their goalies to see all our shots so everyone wants to do that but I thought the Wild were really successful last night even though they just scored the one power play goal creating that that chaos in front it's so and it's so hard and you know uh, Felino gets his stick on a point shot Real close, man. It was real close to that. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was really close. I, I was right call, though. I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I was somewhat surprised that they overturned it, and it was on the line. I mean, the referee said it was at the crossbar, yeah. and the call on the ice was no goal. And I found that to, I thought that was going to be the determining factor. Is like it's so close yeah. that I don't know if they can turn this over, but they they went with hey on the line counts, you know. Yeah, I, it, I, I goes to the runner. This one's a good goal. Yeah, and credit to them, you know, you make the, you know, you make the right call. And and just as I, you know, we talked about it um, after the Dumba hit, you know, the the officials they get together and you all you want them to do is make the right call. Like I, there's a lot of carping about officiating in other series, right? The Edmonton LA series is chaos in part because of the officiating Islanders, Hurricanes, similar storylines of, you know, what's going on there. But really, I, I think the officiating in the first three games of this series has been real good. And and I think there's been, you want it to be right. And that th- was the right call in the Felino. And that was a huge goal, needless to say. But I guess my point on the traffic, if that continues, then and that gives you a better chance to win the special teams battle, which the Wild won last night and had to win. I, uh, you know, I think in, it's critical for them if they are going to win this series. Right, I agree. Now, I think this is a good segue into the officiating because there we touched on earlier in the podcast on how there's been some cat and mouse. I think in managing the calling of the games off of the ice, it's starting to spill onto the ice. You know, you saw Marcus Foligno with. The, the dive body language and kind of mocking Dallas's bench and throwing it at him saying, hey, we're aware that you're diving, just so you know. And um, so I, I think that it, it's an interesting it's an interesting subplot right now is the refereeing. And I agree with you that it has not been bad whatsoever, but both clubs are trying to manage it in their favor. And the team that seems to have gotten the better of the calls in each game has gotten the better of the result too so um game oh. game one the referees i think missed some calls yeah but they i think we talked about it the balance was there side. yeah the balance was there yeah but they missed calls at critical times that, uh, that were that would have hurt the wild overtime going into overtime you know certain trips that they let go the balance of calls was there in game one yeah. i thought dallas just had maybe the they just got the short end of the stick a little bit there game two the wild too many penalties, uh, things were called against them. They they couldn't be physical without getting tens in the end, uh, different things. And then, you know, last night the, the big one was the goal that wasn't turned over. That was kind of, I think, a turning point. When that was a good goal, it was there's no looking back all of a sudden. I think they gave him the goal because he, he pulled up short in his celly. When's the last time you saw a guy, he was like, He's mid. He's midway. He's like gonna pull an arrow, or yeah. I don't know what. He, and then he, he dry fire. And he, he started running back to the ref. I you could hurt yourself doing that. I, you don't want to stop mid celly. And uh, no, I I thought uh, also Middleton. Yeah. Did you see this one? The physical comedy. I mean, first of all, <laughs> Jake Middleton should be in silent movies and like or like the. I don't want to say he would be a Three Stooges because he's not a Stooge, but like he could make you laugh. I would watch a. A silent film with Jake Middleton and his little, his head back. Yeah. <laughs> How he went from like the front of the net all the way to the corner. He air did it like punching five himself. Times. He took five air punches. <laughs> Just a, a left hook, right hook, left hook, boom, boom, boom. He looked like Mike Tyson punch out. Uh, what, what's the guy, the second level? Shoot, I can't remember his name, but when he goes Glass down. Glass Joe? Yeah, yeah. Glass <laughs> Joe goes down. 
<laughs> you know, get that sound effect in there. That's what it looked like. Or uh, or Fight Club, where he's like uh, fighting against himself. It was, he's just he's a beauty. I he, with the with Reeves, Moose, and Middleton. I mean, you, man, you got to make choices if you're another team. And that's you what know, it was. It, I think it's that's a, a it's a tough out. I mean, it's gonna hurt. And that's how it's gonna hurt. That's how Marcus, I think, threw it back in, in Pete DeBoer and Dallas's lap and said, There you go. You know, he reinforced the message from Everson that you guys are diving. And he didn't go out there and do nothing about it. He made it very clear to all of them that, hey, we're aware that you're diving. We're gonna hit you still. And just so you know, we'll call you out on it when you dive. And and he got a dive, didn't he? Last whether night. you like it or not, I think it was effective. Yeah. <laughs> And the pot was calling the kettle black last night for a little bit, for sure. But uh, it, I think it worked because Dallas under. I think Dallas Pete DeBoer understands that Dallas has to win this series on the power play, or if they're going to win it, a big part of it's going to be the power play. And he's trying to tip the calls in his favor and play that game. The Wild took just two penalties last night. They were disciplined, but they were physical. They did it exactly the way they have to, and Dallas just did not have an answer. Well, I, I think it's fair to say that through three games that uh, I would say about 80% of the time, Minnesota's been the better team 5-on-5, five five, right? They faded a little bit in the double overtime game in, in game one, and, and Dallas was, was better as into overtime, as we talked about before. But... Yeah, uh, you know the penalties and the special teams really were the the, the killer blows in in game two, but five on five again last night. And you, you talked about it, Ryan. Just so you know, no odd man rushes, and and the physicality is still there, right? I mean, the the Wild still out, you know, credited to without hitting them twenty six seventeen, um, which is pretty impressive given that you win five one, you have the puck a lot, and right. you're still out hitting them, and not going to the box and. You, uh, and Dean Everson mentioned this after the game last night and hadn't really thought of it, but when you're down a forward for the entire game because Erickson X plays 19 seconds, if you go to the box, it's it punishes your lineup because you're already short. And then, so now you're taxing your guys who kill penalties. You're already out of rhythm. But they didn't do it, right? But they stayed true to the identity of, being physical and separating the stars from the puck and all those kinds of things. And you talked about it earlier, both you guys, you know, there's there's no perfection, but boy, that was pretty darn close last night. Yeah, for sure. I want to talk uh, Klingberg a little bit with you, but before we do, a word from the sponsors. The Wild on 7th pod is sponsored by Gem Sleep. Even Ryan Carter's mother is solving her sleep apnea. We got these late starts for the playoff games. We can't have Dana Carter walking around like a walking zombie, low energy, hurting her relationships, bad for her health. No, she took the initiative. Gem Sleep took care of her, almost like an Uber for sleep apnea. Gem Sleep is where sleep apnea goes to get put to bed. And be like Ryan Carter's mother and uh, reach out to mygemsleep.com forward slash wild. Don't be a walking zombie. Take care of yourself this playoff season, just like Mrs. Carter. All right, everybody. Well, I think with the 80-degree days that just rolled through, we can officially say spring is here, which means it's roofing season. And if you're like me, lived in one of the areas that had the storms roll through with plenty of damage, it can take 18, 24 months for some of that damage to rear its ugly head. Good thing for you, our friends at Wild Construction have a great tool on their website it's, they've got a three-year hail history map. They've got inspection write-ups and other things that you can check out. Super easy to use. Just go to their website, input your address, and they'll give you info on good, better, best price options for your roof and the damage that you might have. Uh, these guys want to help you out. They're a Minnesota-based company, good quality guys. And, hey, man, it, Wild Construction, they make it happen. Check them out, wildconstructionmn.com. Well, the Wild are in the second season, the best one. And you know what? It's also slaw season. Do not sleep on the slaw. Get yourself some Jimmy's coleslaw. They have original, pineapple, and fat-free. So you got that paper plate rocking out by the grill. You got that warm burger, a little bit of crunch, and then you add some cool coleslaw texture. It's the best of all worlds happening at your BBQ. Check it out. They're a Minnesota company down from Stewartville, Minnesota, family-owned. 
Check out Jimmy's Salad Dressings and Dips. Don't sleep on the slaw. Don't you be messing with my dresses. So I thought Klingberg, you know, he he inserts himself into the series and whether he was available in game two and they just wanted to stick with their guys or whatever it was, not sure, but they come home. And the question mark with Klingberg playing, I think, is going to be, you look at the number, it, it was minus 27 or 20, I don't even have it in front of me, uh, but it was a tough year for him defensively, and that's the question mark. You know, can I trust him defensively? And you come home, and I think you can you can put him in better spots to where, you know, you, you don't start him in certain situations, you can manage the matchups and uh, use him on the power play, get him going. Uh, I thought that he inserted himself into this series in a real big way. And he seemed motivated playing against the stars. He, he was good. I think he, what did he end up with? Uh, was it, did he have two apples? Yeah, plus he got two. two. Plus three. Plus yeah. three. Yep. yep. I and mean, he, what a game. Yeah, and you know what, pretty, you know, pretty manageable amount of ice time for a guy who has, you know, missed the first two games. So he played 16-38. Um and I, I had a chance to chat with him after the game, and uh, and we talked about this before because if he's gonna play, um, you know, if he's playing with Brock Faber, both right-handed shots, and so so yeah. John's gonna play on his offside. Yeah. You talked about the challenges there. He was pretty good about it last night. He said, you know, I think there are some things that are easier on the offside, and then some things that are harder. But he said, bottom line is, coach wants me to play on the left side. I'm happy to. I'm here to win. And Dean Evanson mentioned something last night, and I think it's very true. You know, the book on John Klingberg is that he elevates in the playoffs. And when Dallas went to the final in the bubble, he was their best player, certainly their best forward. I mean, I guess Hudobin might have been their best player, but he was their best skater uh, night in and night out. And he talked about it last night after the game. I, you know, I love the playoffs. It's just you know, that's this is what it's all about. And you, this guy is, hey, he's motivated because he's going to be a UFA. And it didn't happen for him last summer, and he ended up taking the one-year deal in Anaheim. And he goes there, and he, it's the whole team's a nightmare. And, you know, this is a chance for him because he wants to win. He's uber competitive. But the big picture for him is this is, you know, all you know the eyes are going to be on him. The longer this team plays, and if he plays like he did last night, there will be people lined up trying to, you know, to, to vie for his services. It's an audition. And yeah. And, <clears throat> boy, the country of Sweden has to be looking forward to this playoff and hoping that the Minnesota Wild go on a run, too, because their tax balance will go up quite a bit if some of these guys get these deals. Right. You've got Nyquist, Johansson, Klingberg, yeah. you know, Sundquist. A lot of these guys are up for deals, and <laughs> uh, those tax bills, they could be valuable That's to the country it. of Sweden at some point. But uh, you're going to like this stat. Uh, I was looking for – information confirmation jamie ben I, I felt like i've seen him fight in the playoffs before is he taking a major he's been turning the cheek and i want to make the point that it's different now with him like this was his past he's he's doing he did the center ice deal wasn't that that's him? that's what i thought that's what i remember so i went or maybe I, that was gets left i went on a, and threw a search up there in stats dallas playoffs majors guess who leads dallas in major penalties uh, from probably 2008 to now, John Klingberg. Really fighting? I don't know what the majors were. That's what that was my next question. I didn't have time to research that, but beatboxing. This dude's grit first too. Yeah. What throwing, is beatboxing? A throwing major? zin. I don't know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> a two zins and a beatbox. Like he's a got a little bit of hate in him too. How does John Klingberg have two majors in the playoffs? I actually want to know. Now. Well, he talks to him. Why don't you ask well, him? I'm that? gonna find out now. <laughs> they have to be. Part of me thinks it's one of them's gonna be like a stick penalty, like. That's something bad. Like a dirty stick, you know. Like it's, it's hard to get a major if you don't fight. You've done something not good. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah I don't know. And I I don't have any – it so, doesn't come to memory. So the soft me. hands, uh, walk the blue line, skill defenseman. Majors. Two majors yeah. in the playoffs. Jamie Ben, how many think he has? One. Zero. So that fight thing we're imagining, who was that? Was that Getzloff? Well, it's Getzloff and, uh, and, it was Getzloff and Thornton. Yeah. But, I, but I feel like Ben has done something similar with Thornton, with Getzloff. And, um, he's, but he's New Testament. Yeah, I was wrong. He's, uh, yeah, he's like the old Mad Max, like Mel Gibson. We're dealing with the new one, the good one. Um, hey, uh, so one goalie thing that was funny last night. So 
you know, the crowd was just wild. And so they're doing the sieve thing to Ottinger. It was like the just, you know, but then they're trying to do the flurry deal. But his name has three syllables, right? And it's kind of a hard name to say. So the fan base, they started trying to do otter, otter, which you can't do because it's almost like a compliment. You're like calling him his nickname or whatever. So I would just say, if we're going to do that, we got to grind through the three syllables. We got to go Ottinger, Ottinger, like Flurry. I mean, if we're going to really get in this kid's head, I know he's from Lakeville or he's from Ville because we keep the lakes. He can just be from Ville. But I, I think, uh, I think you know, we can't, we can't chant Otter. That sounds like we're cheering for him, no? Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> you can't be like Spurgy, Spurgy. I mean, you, that's his nickname. You got to grind it out. It's three syllables. We can do it. Can you do a chant with three syllables, though? I think you can go, Ottinger, Ottinger, like kind of. I don't know. I, I guess that's, that's a good though. thing. If you have a kid and he's got a three-syllable or four-syllable last name, that's when he should be a goalie and only then. That's the stuff you're not going to get, like, at the Athletic or whatever. <laughs> I'm here all night, Burnside. <laughs> oh, that's good. Hey, but oh, I want to ask you, Kinger, what uh, – Everything okay with with Kirill? Okay, so here's where we're at with Kirill. The pad was out last night, the Kawabunga pad. You saw it late? Yeah, I saw yeah. it. Uh, w- one hit, one shot. So we're in this weird Netherland with Kirill. I thought he was – his hips were open. I thought he was feeling the puck. He was moving around. Um, his line mates are getting happy. I think it's going to be okay, yeah. I, I thought he looked uh, he looked like himself last night. Uh, the biggest thing with Krill, I think, is I think he needs to skate a little bit with the puck on his stick. He needs to have a feel for the puck. And uh, when I see the hips open up, I know that he's feeling pretty good. And he, I, he, there were glimpses. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't on the score sheet, um, but uh, I think that's good because it's a, you're playing a long game here. I, I don't think Karel Kaprizov's just going to you know, be held scoreless in every game. So at some point he pops off. If Zuki helps us win that one and Nyquist and Moose and – Jojo, then there'll be a Corel game at some point. But it's kind of interesting, though, right? You're up 2-1 if you're the Wild, and, you know, you, you've stolen home ice, and now you're taking advantage of it. And Kaprizov has been, you know, his impact has been modest, I think it's fair to say. Dean Evanson talked about it the other day. You know, he needs to have the puck more, and I, and I agree with you, John. I, uh, you know, and I thought he was better last night, and I thought there were moments where he – he, uh, to me, he distributes the puck, you know, for a guy who is a, a, a scorer. Um, he distributes the puck wonderfully, and I don't think it matters to him if he scores or not. So um, I thought it was much better. But between Kaprizov and Boldy, in terms of the actual point production, um, y- you know, there's more to come, I think. But I think both those players have been good. I, I have really liked Boldy's game, and I think he makes – I think – I love to see how he handles the puck. And I watch now because of what you said, Ryan, how many times is he going to his knees? And and I thought he was really good again last night. Mm-hmm. You know, held the puck and, you know, making making plays. And at some point, talent like that will be rewarded, I believe. And so, like you say, they, John, I mean, I, he, I think that's what's good. And they were on the ice football. a lot together last night. Do you yeah. notice that? Boldy and Carell were on. I don't know what was going on. It wasn't just the um, post power play. Uh, those two guys were – were on the I thought I was going to get my my little joy joy but uh they were on the ice a lot more I felt like maybe I was just reading into it but it felt like they were on the ice a lot more together and I think you're right talent gets rewarded because I don't feel like the penalty on Delandrio was a penalty the referees called it a trip and Boldy was trying to beat I forget who it was I think it was Hawk and Paw or it was Marchment that gives him a shove in the back so this is when Boldy draws the penalty. It was shoving the back, and Boldy was trying to get the hips open, cut it to the inside of the ice, and Delandria caught him like right on the kneecap with a, a light stick. And Boldy goes down, and it looked like a trip, but it wasn't. And those are the kind of instances that, that I'm talking about where Boldy's trying to make these plays, but he gets bumped, and he goes down. And it's, it's a skill play, but he got rewarded for at least attempting it in the power play. And I think that is actually the one that, that Marcus scores on. So that Just power play that yeah. follows it. Um, but, and, and then Boldy too, you're right. Like it, he hasn't been able to cash in, but I think he was second through two games, second in the NHL in shots 
in, in the playoffs. He had, an ol- he had an assist last night. He was only behind Nathan McKinnon. So as much as it's like it's not going in for him right now, he's still producing and doing what you want him to do. Seven shots a game through the first two. I mean, what more can you ask from a guy? I understand game one had a couple OTs, but seven shots game two, too. Like, I mean, he's getting his looks. He's getting his chances. And um, I, I think you're right that if if you're staying and towing that positive line, Kaprizov – not playing his best hockey and really not it doesn't seem anywhere near his best hockey and the wild are still leading the series two to one with another game at xl energy center well I mean, you know ryan uh monday is Carell's birthday so we got a game tomorrow and we got a game on tuesday and Carell's birthday is on monday might have to go up to moscow on the hill <laughs> get a little martini and oh, i think- there's going to be a Krill, Russian sauce. There's going to be a Krill game coming up here. Yeah, you watch. I, I want to talk about Spurgeon too. Uh, what did he play? Twenty three minutes last night. This guy is a stud. He is such an important part of the team, and uh, he's just he's just elevating. I mean, he you know people like the calming presence of Gus uh, the Gus bus. I think Spurgeon's the same thing. I mean, just throw him. Just keep throwing him out there. I mean, he's been absolutely great uh on the back end and he's just you know he's the captain i think sometimes because he's a smaller guy or a quieter guy you forget this is the leader of our hockey club and he the way he carries himself and plays um yeah i've grown uh i've just started to appreciate it so much more over these last couple years watching this guy i think he's been great in the playoffs so far well i i appreciate him too because he recognized after i got stuck in the nose that that looks like playoff ready no, he, he got banged up so hard. he wanted to he wanted to duplicate the look he got a couple of stitches he won up to me a little bit but um no he's he's playing playoff hockey all of a sudden too king i want to ask you before we get out of here because there's a lot of good subplots in this series and and I'm going to touch on a few just so the fans, I think, can can follow along with all of them. But one of them was, who are you going to hate? And is there anybody on Dallas that you're hating through three games, Kinger? I don't like Jamie Benn um, because I, I think, to me, he's uh, he's he wants to be Moose, but he isn't. And I just I, to me, it's Old Testament, New Testament. I just... Uh, he he gets under my skin. The Suter thing um, is a little complicated in my head because of what happened to Pavelski, and that's his boy, and he went down. And I know the code of hockey, as far as I'm concerned, if you hurt a star player, you don't go hurt Matt Dumba, but you hurt their star player. That is playoff hockey. It's a, it's not a straight line. And so him going after Kaprizov, I don't know. I think if he was on our team and Kaprizov had been knocked out, I mean, and somebody, so Duhame was cross-checking, you know, Robertson in the back. We would love Duhame. So I, I kind of, I give him a little bit more. Jamie Ben to me, just isn't exactly what he's advertising. You know, he, he's, he's puffed out his chest, but he's just, it's not really there. And to me, that's weird because we have an entire hockey team full of guys where the there is there, whether it's Connor Dewar, Mason Shaw, I think Kirill's ready to go. Dumba. You need that for your preseason predictions. Reeves, Middleton, Fleury. I mean, all these guys are it's it's Yeah, Dean's doubled down on that. They will cross the They want to fight, we'll fight. We will. They will walk across the tracks. And I think Dallas has Dallas has a lot of guys that like to stand at the edge of the tracks and look across. But isn't that like to me the fascinating part now is in Dallas and around that team now, the same questions are being asked of that team and, and those leaders. You know, Rope Hans, I don't think, had a shot last night. Jason Robertson had three. But it just, to me, he his impact has been almost exclusively on the power play and, and, and not on five-on-five. Five. So the question is now being asked of Dallas. Listen, you know, wh- where are you at? You just got, you just got handled. You're down 2-1. You know, you're, you know, the pressure's on them in a huge way to respond, to park last night's game, and all those kinds of things that the Wild had to answer for and then did, right? I mean, it's, it's I mean, you tell me what you think, Ryan, but when you, you can say, oh, yeah, we're going we, to we're gonna wash that game and we're going we're gonna to move forward. When you get, when you, when you are crushed, and it's happened now two games in a row, when you get crushed, 
Uh, like, I think that would be hard. I would be thinking about it all the time. Man, we sucked. You know, what's going to happen? And worrying about it. But you can't, right? And But right. the questions on, th- those questions are being asked to the stars. And that's, you know, when Bill Garrett and I were chatting this morning, we were just talking about the series. And he's like, you know, tomorrow, they, they will have to come with their best. Because if they don't, and they go down 3-1, well, now you're, in, now you're deep in it. Right. So Yeah, that's a deep hole they can't climb out of. And where, where I'm looking for Dallas right now is their D pairs and getting back to people that you hate. My prediction was that Wild fans would hate Hawk and Pock and, uh, Hawk and, Pock and Lindell. And they haven't. I don't even really know their names. No, like they haven't really been a factor. I thought it would be impossible for the Wild to get to the net with these guys on the ice, and that hasn't been the case. They've been slower skating. The, the Wild have been able to get them off the rush, sitting back, and uh, they've exposed them to some degree. And now Miller getting danced by Joe Hansen. The only D-man for Dallas that has stood out in a good way is Haskinen. And He's I, very good. And I wouldn't be surprised now. if Pete, and, and I think this series does go 3-1 if Pete DeBoer does not change his D pairs. If he doesn't find some different chemistry there somehow, then I don't know how Dallas can figure this out because they're, they're just not solving the wild problems. Are they you had trying to get in his head like you, you want him to keep the D pairs the same and you're trying to get him to switch them? Are you doing like a post Reverse psychology? Press conference? Well, I can't tell you what I'm doing, okay, otherwise okay, I'll know okay, what I'm sorry. doing. I shouldn't have asked him. We can cut that off. Do you think he's, do you think he's listening in the, in, the, in the same way that when Dean, yeah, Dean. Dean was talking oh, these about these guys are all listening to the podcast. <laughs> do, they're do watching. players listen to post-game pressers when the playoffs? Is it's not that long. It's usually twenty minutes. You get the coach and two well, what, players. What, Do guys listen to that when what, they're in the playoffs? What I will say is that there there are plenty of people covering it, like Scott, and all the important quotes are not missed. So those He'll quotes let them know what they those said. quotes will come past <laughs> their eyes at some point or their ears. So but that was a great. I did enjoy the whole. Like I was a bit surprised when Dean unprovoked, you know, brought up the whole yeah. embellishing thing and. We don't dive, and you know, like, because that was no one said to him at the charter terminal. By the way, do you think the stars are diving? He was like, "Oh, by the way, before don't go away yet, because I'm going to make my <laughs> wait, wait, one more, here. one more, one more." And then, uh, it, as it turned out, it was it was me. So, but it's not always about me. But I did ask Pete then at his morning conference. Yeah, well, you know, so this was said, and that's when he came. Up. I thought it was a pretty good line. You know, he gives a shot at uh, at the Wild. Well, I guess if I was coaching one of the most penalized teams in the NHL, I would be too, you know, it's called deflection. Right. And I'd be doing that. So maybe good coaching by him. My guess is that people will be very unhappy with what happened with this team last night. And so, you know, the little give and take. Um, but now, the, you know, now the rubber's hitting the road in this series. And it's, it, it is, uh, it's funny how it's played out that way. No, oh, again, the subplots. And let's go through them. It's the two coaches managing, officiating in penalties. Yep. And Dean unprovoked throws it back on Pete. Pete throws it back on Dean. And then Dean's players throw it Loose. back at Pete. You got physical that's how it comedy worked. from Middleton. It's and, like a whole like play. Yeah, and it's amazing because, and that's what I think if you're looking at that, the team is getting behind their coach and helping support him in that regard like yeah. if coach says they're diving they're diving this is it like we're not going to let this happen and yeah. um pretty impressive goaltending subplot two young goaltenders they've been great which one is gonna you know outduel the other i think we have our answer so far early on it's been the gus bus better than ottinger experience thrown out the window doesn't matter um you know the the top guns right now caprice and robertson which one of those guys is going to shine the brightest? And To be determined. Yeah, TBD, because I would say both of them are on the dimmer switch right around, you know, halfway bright, you know. And um, I think you can continue on with, with some of these plots. It's who are you going to hate. And I think if you're in Dallas, you absolutely hate Marcus Foligno today. Uh, you know, maybe – in the wild sweaters, you're hating Ryan Suter and Jamie Ben, but um, there is some malice. There's there's some anger. Some great subplots to this, and I think they're unpredictable in some regards too. But uh, a lot of fun to follow along. I don't love Domi either. I'll throw him on the list. He did, I don't know how much he plays. I didn't look at the sheet, but he seems to be targeting uh, 97 as well, which is not a good trade for us. So well, but that's what that's so great. Go ahead. Now they're targeting 97. But what's happening? 
five other Zuccarello's guys. got ice. Hartman's got ice. JoJo comes out following one of their shifts and um, is playing with speed, and, and they're distracted by something else. Like, it's um, – that Dallas has really struggled to to find a response. They really have. That I would say just Marcus Johansson, and I, for a long time, covering a lot of Eastern Conference playoffs, spent a lot of time around the Caps, and I just – and maybe it was just the way that team was built, and they – you know, they were just, you know, they had, you know, Nikki Backstrom and Ovi and, you know, Mike Green and all, you know, it, I'm just, I'm amazed when I see him generate the speed through the neutral zone and the speed and his ability to handle the puck at speed all over the ice. Again, what, uh, it makes what a me, nice pickup. Like, holy yeah. cow. But doesn't it make you wonder, like, how is this guy, not, like, how did he get to you in that spot, right? Don't play cards with Bill Guerin. Right. This but also guy, at the same time. Guy, like, if I see Bill Guerin in my trash, I know like I threw a watch away by accident. Whoever or whatever is motivating these guys, they're pressing the right buttons. And whether that's a contract, a Stanley Cup, opportunity, whatever it is, what's motivating these guys is getting the best out of them. I think this is, and, and we'll have to ask Johansson at some point, this might be the best stretch of hockey that I've ever seen him play. And and this is across years in the NHL playing against him. Yeah, well, and again, I, you know, I'm, I, did, I don't mean to throw shade in that he wasn't good before, but to see... He was good, but now he's playing great. He, and he was he, a good player. Now he's, now he's a great player. Yeah, and... You know, again, Matt yes. Boldy helps too. Yeah, but I mean, you have to find a player to play with the good players, and you know, whatever the symbiotic relationship is, he has fed right into that. And you know, it's yes, it's Bill Guerin, it's his team. But and I know he's talked about this with, you know, acquiring Gustafson. It's that hockey ops department. Like if your scouting department comes back to you and says, you know what, well, I, we can get Marcus Johansson back, and it's Probably, it's, I can't even remember what they gave up for him, but it wasn't fourth rounder. Ah, uh, third round maybe. Third rounder. Same thing with Gustafson. It's or Gustafson, with Nyquist. It's yes, we think he's going to be able to play. And again, not you. You didn't sell the farm to bring him in, but your your scouting staff came to you and said, um, you know, Sunquest or all of it, where you can say. We're not going to have to mortgage our future, but here are some pieces that could fit in. John Klingberg, right? I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, terrible year in Anaheim. Well, who didn't? Terrible team. So right. I don't know. The hockey ox department that comes to the table and says, okay, here's some guys. Mm-hmm. Here's a deadline. Here's, you know, don't have a lot of cap space, and you know what the you know the future of the cap space is here with this team. Man, those they have brought in people who have made significant impacts without having to – you know, mortgage any kind of future, really. Yeah, it's and you think about it, it's one thing to go into the deadline with a plan. It's another one to execute it. They executed it. I mean, that was uh, that was impressive. And, uh, yeah, the, they're all paying dividends. So kudos to them. King, you got anything else before we... I just want to say... Right into 5.30 what a, Sunday. What a great day. You know, it was so unlike how it usually feels in Minnesota sometimes. We had Vikings tight ends slamming beers in the crowd. We had the lead singer of Soul Asylum. So it on. wasn't a tight end. It, it was. There were th- three tight ends, I think. Yeah. Um, you missed that one. Dave, I did. Dave <laughs> Perner's on the uh, Jumbotron Soul Asylum lead singer. It was very Minnesota. We painted a Picasso, as we know in these playoffs. Yeah, we got. Are you going to hang the M's? We got two. <laughs> they're W's. The, well, it's Minnesota win, so it's <laughs> the UPC. If you look, these are W's. I. I they're similar to M's, but uh, we do have two W's. Um, as we know, things can change in a harpy. But I will say, when we do get a W, I enjoy kind of waiting, waiting into the Splitting warm water burger. with you. It's okay to talk. Visiting for, suites like the president. We can talk for 55 minutes. When we lose, it's a little tough sledding. It might be about 28-minute podcast. But let's enjoy these W's. They're hard to come by in the Stanley Cup playoffs. We're here. So let's hear.